Good morning, this is Barbara Slavin, the Morse Institute Library, the Veterans Oral History Project. It's June 19, 2001, and we're here to interview Karen Lynch. Uh, Karen, could you tell me what your address is? I live in, in Charlestown, Massachusetts. And I should have asked you, what is your full name? Karen Ann Lynch. Okay. And may I ask your age? Well, okay, <laughs> it's 43. You don't have to. <laughs> Where were you born? Uh, I was born in Jamaica Plain, Faulkner Hospital. Okay. And where were you raised? Framingham. Oh. And could you tell me what Framingham was like when you, grow, when you were growing up? Hmm. Well, it, to me, it seemed like sort of an ideal place to grow up uh, since it's the suburbs. Uh, um, very pleasant. I remember great summers. Uh, school was okay. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, no, I thought it was a nice place to grow up. We had. Not the most attractive Route 9 that we all deal with, but um, we could always go shopping and have no yeah. difficulty. And, um, you know, when I grew up, we had the, the brass bell, the ship's bell out there, and I would, uh, my mother would ring it to bring us home at night in the summer, <laughs> and uh, it was kind of nice. So, and we swam. We had a pool, so we were always swimming and doing sports and things. Mm -hmm. So it was a, I liked Framingham a lot. Very diverse group. How did you happen to have a, a ship's bell? Uh, you know, in those days, I think that, um, I don't know how we actually got it, but we were not the only ones. It was a neighborhood thing. Um, there were two or three bells, and we could all tell the difference. We knew exactly what our bell sounded like. So I don't know how we got it. My father got it, I guess. I'm strange now that you, you mention it. Was he in the armed services? He was. He was uh, in the Navy in Navy. World War II okay. and uh, in the Army in Korea. What is your family background? As far as well, uh, ethnic. Oh, background. okay. Um, well, mostly Irish, I guess. Yeah. Uh, the families came over in the 1850s. Yeah. Um, also French, and they came most. I think most came through Canada, Nova Scotia, and my dad's family was from Pittsfield, Fitchburg. Mm -hmm. uh, it's somewhere between Pittsfield and Fitchburg, and then my mother's family, Melrose, Malden, Medford, um, and then my mother grew up in Medford. And my father grew up in Jamaica mm -hmm. Plain. So, could you tell me uh, where and uh, when you entered the military? I entered in uh, 1984 through uh, Boston, mm -hmm. um, recruiting district Boston. It was, uh, I think I put my hand up on <laughs> July 13th, 1984. My father gave me a, uh, of all things, a Canadian maple leaf coin that day for good luck, and I still have it. What branch did you choose? I went into the Navy. And do you, uh, could you tell me why? Um, probably a number of reasons. Uh, one of which was because my father was in, he used to tell me stories of the military anyway, so uh, that was part of it. Um, but every summer he would bring my brother and I to USS Constitution. It was sort of an annual trip, and we'd take a tour. And uh, I sort of began to romanticized the Navy at that time and listening to his stories. He had a lot more fun during World War II than he did during Korea. Yeah. And, uh, and then I think what did it for me is my cousin was a Marine and I went to visit him in Lejeune, uh, North Carolina. I know it was Quantico, now that I think of it. He was at the basic school in Quantico. And I remember seeing a, must have been a doctor, a naval officer in service dress blue uniform. And I thought, that's a nice uniform. <laughs> so I decided the Navy was the way to go. And actually, I, I started to join the, um, the Marine Corps. I was in college at the time when I started the process. And um, the Marines had hold of me and wanted a woman. They definitely mm -hmm. wanted a woman for their uh, quotas, perhaps, for New England. And my cousin was in the Marine Corps at the time. And he said, please don't do this. They're not ready for women yet. This was in uh, the late 70s. I didn't yeah. join for several years after school. And uh, he said, literally sent me a, uh, a note saying, are you on some kind of drug? <laughs> he said, please, they're not ready. So yeah. in 10 years, maybe, but right now, no. So he said, choose another service. So I walked into the Air Force office, the you know, recruiting office. Oh, I didn't even get over the threshold. And the, um, somebody leaned out and said, do you want to be a pilot? And I said, well, I don't have 20-20. He said, two-year wait. Uh -huh. So that was my introduction to the Air yeah. Force, and then I went to the Navy. And that, with all the other things combined, uh, I did go through with the Navy, ultimately. How did your father feel about your joining the Navy? Well, the reason I <laughs> didn't go in initially is because both my parents uh, thought I'd lost my mind. Uh, 
Oh. And I think my dad was very proud, but I think he wasn't sure if I knew what I was getting myself into. And uh, so I, the first time around, they said, we really don't think it's a good idea. We think you're a little young. Uh, I, was, I think I was socially uh, a little slower than the rest of my uh, peers, so I, um, I said okay. Mm -hmm. And then I went, um, went a couple of years and applied again. And then I scared myself. And I thought, oh, they said, go ahead. If you, if you still feel that way, do it. And I got scared. I was like, ooh, four-year <laughs> commitment, I don't know. And then finally, I brought it up one last time, and my parents looked at me and said, will you please go in and get it over with? Because I knew I'd regret it. It was a big adventure, and I, you know, if I didn't go, I would never know what I missed. And it was the best thing in my life. So, so what happened after you enlisted? Where did you go? <clears throat> well, um, I initially signed up and, as I said, raised my hand July 13, 1984. And I got an officer candidate school class. They give you the class and tell you when you're coming mm -hmm. in Newport, Rhode Island um, mm -hmm. for uh, no I guess it was November. And um, went in November and I was there uh, as an officer candidate for four months mm -hmm. approximately through Christmas. And that was all rather interesting. So I started there and uh, that was an eye-opening experience. It's, it's not on the level of boot camp. You can't compare it, um, but it was boot camp for me. It was pretty, uh, for me it was pretty tough. It was academic and physical and mental stress. Mm -hmm. And um, it was the biggest achievement of my life to get oh. through and be commissioned in Ensign, which was March 22nd, 1985. So that was a big deal. But that was my initial entry into the service. And did you receive uh, any specialized training? There, or did you get the basic training for an ensign? Um, the only, that, well, basic training in a way, but what I thought was interesting is I was, women were still kind of, at that time, that was, as I said, 84, 85, women were still, they were some on support ships, mm -hmm. and I had wanted to go on board a ship, and we had several prior enlisted women who were there who got selected, but we all were trained for shipboard uh, service. So I learned uh, Marlin Spike seamanship and uh, how, to, how to drive a ship, how mm -hmm. to sail a ship, um, mo maneuvering board to keep ships from crashing on the high seas, um, piloting, celestial navigation. So yes, oh, I man. did have specialized training. It was an introduction mostly, um, but that, that was a whole new world for me, nothing I'd ever dealt oh. with before. Celestial navigation was especially interesting. Oh. But that was the, initially the specialized training that I received. And, but as you said, it, it probably isn't different than any other ensign going in, but it was new to me. So, well, it was new to everybody. Oh, yeah. Nobody else had it either. So what happened after that? Um, well, I went to my, actually I started at the recruiting district. Uh, they do hometown area recruiting to give you some time to be with your family before you go do the, the big time. Mm -hmm. And so I did stay for about, I think, four or five months and did recruiting at, um, uh, Boston, where I had sworn in. Mm -hmm. And then I went to um, my first tour, which was in Washington, D.C. I was a placement officer, mm -hmm. uh, which is more or less like a headhunter for mm -hmm. the Navy, if you will. I would, uh, let's say I had responsibility for the companies, if, if you want to put it, or commands, mm -hmm. and there was another individual who was called a detailer who had responsibility for the people. And we got together and they nominated people to me and, um, and I said yes or no up through the uh, 05 level, which is commander or lieutenant colonel level. And once you got to 06 or Navy captain, uh, it was a uh, nomination process that went higher than me. But um, I was in what's referred to as an 05 billet mm -hmm. because that's a commander's billet as an ensign, which is an 01. Mm -hmm. And the reason was because before I had joined the uh, Navy, I worked at uh, General Ship Corporation in South Boston and was doing contract estimating and that sort of thing. So I had some, some history. And the job that I went into was uh, worked with something called NAVC, NAVAIR, and then NAVALEX, which is now known as SPA Wars, mm -hmm. um, Space and Naval Warfare Systems. And NAVC was Naval, Warfare, or Naval, sea, sys, Naval sea Systems. And obviously NAVAIR is the air side of the Navy. And because of my background, it fit right into what they were doing. Mm. Um, so the captain had just selected me. And it was a great job because most of the other ensigns, all female, uh, were sent to DC and were what they call stashed. 
They had no real job, no real billet. They did do things, they assisted and yeah. so forth until their next real job. Most of the guys were going off and being surface warfare officers or pilots yeah. or submariners. And, uh, but the women couldn't do that then, so we were sort of on hold. And I was one of the lucky ones that had a, a real, not just an ensign job, but a real 05 billet. I literally had a heavy responsibility. I had over 2,000 billets or jobs that I was responsible for Ooh. filling and 400 commands. Uh, where those jobs took place, so it was a very good, uh, very good tour. Not, I wouldn't say it was the most exciting tour, but um, it definitely was um, very great responsibility. So it was, uh, it was an interesting time. And how long did that last? It was two years. Mm -hmm. And just before I left there, I made lieutenant junior grade, right. and that was kind of exciting. So I could be referred to as lieutenant, mm -hmm. which is a big deal, yeah. even though I was only a junior grade. <laughs> And, um, and then I went off to uh, Hawaii, mm -hmm. um, and it was a fluke because uh, my detailer had asked me what did I want to do, and I said, I don't know. And you have a choice. When you pick where you want to go, you can pick by location, by job, uh, or by type of command. Mm -hmm. and, and they will, you prioritize those three things, and whatever your top pick is is what they'll try to give you, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, and then they back it off and uh, give you whatever they can after that. And then you have three of those choices, mm -hmm. so there's backups for everything. But anyway, um, so I got my, I didn't actually plan. Somebody, I, somebody had said to me, what, what would you really love to do? And I said, well, one of the things I really heard, I loved when I heard about it in uh, Office Candidate School was uh, doing the uh, protocol job, which isn't a real career path, mm -hmm. but it just sounded fascinating. Right. And so, I said, that sounded fabulous. Well, the next thing I know, less than a month later, the guy that I was mentioning it to said to me, um, have I got a job for you? And I said, what? And he, I didn't work for him. Yeah. He just happened to work. I was in the best place one could be. You get to pick from whatever's going on, because that's where all the jobs were. That's where they were all managed from. So um, a tour came up in Hawaii, and it was uh, US Commander uh, in Chief Pacific Command, which is the top command in the Pacific uh, for America. And uh, it's the station, uh, we were stationed in uh, Camp Smith, Hawaii, which is right over Pearl Harbor. And it was a three-year tour. So I was ultimately a protocol officer for uh, US Sync PAC, which is what the, the acronym is for that. And um, that was a superb experience because um, as a protocol officer for the senior command, uh, nobody reported to me. but. The other commands all reported to my boss. I worked for a four-star admiral. And it's always a four-star admiral, even though it's all service, because 60% of it uh, is ocean. And so that makes sense to have uh, mm -hmm. an admiral. It's a permanent position. It's, it's like the Joint Chiefs of Staff varies, mm -hmm. uh, but it's mostly Marine Corps and Army. It tends to be. But uh, SYNCPAC is always Navy. So um, anyway, it was a great tour. I, in protocol, one of the, I did a lot of things, but uh, specifically I uh, was involved with the whole Pacific Rim, all the countries that would make up the Pacific Rim. I was responsible for getting um, initial contact with whoever the visitor was. And this could be a foreign visitor from one of those places, or it could be one of our people going out to post as an ambassador in one of those places and they would come out to Hawaii to get their, one, to stop over and refuel, but also to get their Pacific Rim update. And um, so what I would do is I'd go, um, I'd set all this up. I'd set up a Pacific area update. I'd set up the, um, they would, their people, I'd deal direct with their aid if they had one. And um, what I would do is I'd end up uh, setting up their, any uh, business with the Admiral. I'd set up calls with the Admiral. Mm -hmm. I would um, decide whether the Pacific Area update could be um, secure or a classified brief or an unclassified brief, depending on the background of the individual. If they were from certain countries, we could not give them the full briefing. So uh, I had to do research with the Intelligence Center Pacific, which is right at Camp Smith, to find out about the country. And then I'd talk to the J-5 staff, which is plans and policy and say, OK, I need an escort officer and I need background on this country from a, uh, what's the political situation in the country right now? 
And so I would put together a whole sort of package visit, and then I would also ask one of the more senior officers to escort. Uh, if it were one or two star general or admiral equivalent, uh, the higher it goes, the more I get involved. If it's four, three or four stars, I would be directly involved throughout the whole trip and probably would do all the escorting. Um, and so that was one level. We had ambassadors, let's see, what's my list, my litany. Um, we had kings and queens, lots of kings and queens, and that could be the king and queen of Spain at that time. Oh. And um, the king of Tonga and his, the crown prince. Um, the, uh, the princess, who's actually older than the crown prince because she's never going to be in charge, mm -hmm. of Samoa. But Tonga and Samoa are very connected. Mm -hmm. um, some of the small island nations all have kings and queens, and, um, and they're treated equally as the President of the United States or any other president or head of state. So we had a lot of heads of state. We had prime minister, two or three prime ministers of Japan because they had a rough, bumpy season then, and we had the entire diet from Japan, which is the cabinet, or excuse right. me, the, uh, basically their Congress. Right. And, uh, you know, culturally, the other part I haven't even mentioned is the fact that I advise, there's one side that's logistical. I, get, I expedite customs, I expedite, uh, I'll go and I'll meet the person and I'll literally hand carry them through. And, um, but I also worked with the FBI, Secret Service on presidential visits, and we did all our logistical planning together. Um, and then, um, what else? Oh, customs and immigration expedites, working with uh, HPD, which other people seem to know is Hawaii Five-O, but it's really <laughs> HPD, Honolulu Police Department. And um, uh, let's see what else. Um, work with the local consulates, uh, the foreign consulates, the Australians, especially the Japanese, especially. Um, and so then the other side of it is you become a, a country expert to a certain degree. I Cultural, uh, religious, dietary, all the things that might enter into a visit, mm -hmm customs you need to know what you're dealing with like for instance if if you give some if a Japanese businessman or a Japanese uh, military officer gives you a business card the typical thing for an American would be to to take the business card and say thank you very much and shove it in mm -hmm. a purse or a wallet or a briefcase um, that would be a terrible insult to somebody who's mm -hmm. Japanese um, what you're supposed to do is you know look at it observe it take interest in it and say thank you very much because it's a it's almost a gift to you that they decided to give you this card so anyway that's what I did and um, you know when you're talking about island nations every island nation is different than the next um, certainly Japan Korea everything you have to learn about what the cultural uh, situation is in each country so that was sort of the fun one China we had People's Republic of China the president came and um, the Admiral did not listen to us. I, had, I worked for a chief of protocol oh. who was a Marine. What happened? Ah, it wasn't pretty. Um, he, uh, we had told, I won't even say who it was, mm -hmm. but we had told uh, the Admiral and his wife, uh, Sink Pack at, at the time, uh, the Admiral and his wife that the Chinese don't eat dairy products. And because they don't, they also cannot. In other words, if you, know, if you have a whole history of not eating a particular kind of food mm -hmm. in, in a culture, then you're unable to digest right. it. So um, Mrs. Sink Pack um, went against our suggestion to not serve anything. And what she did, we had, we had the president and uh, 50 of his uh, cabinet, et cetera, at their home, uh, Quarters A, at Pearl Harbor. And um, he, what happened was she served uh, cheese and crackers. Mm -hmm. She served uh, salad with Roquefort dressing serve steak bordelaise, um, cheesecake for dessert, it just goes on and on, and 51 Chinese ate absolutely nothing. It was an international incident, um, not serious enough to make the papers, but uh, we had insulted them terribly, and we told the Admiral and his wife, you cannot serve them dairy, and they didn't believe it. And uh, so anyway, that was, a, that was a bad one, and they never not listened to us again. And because you do research, that's right. a big part of the job is knowing what you're dealing with. And um, so anyway, that was kind of interesting. But but Hawaii was a great tour because uh, you're in the you're you're in a historic place, 
Um, I remember one day, I'm, I tend to be sort of on the patriotic side, ex ex ignoring my outfit, <laughs> um, but I remember one day I was driving, it happened to be December 7th and I was picking up a, um, we used to call them VIPs or DVs, um, VIP for VIP or DV for Distinguished Visitor, mm -hmm. and it was, I, I think I dropped off the Australian Admiral and his entourage at about four in the morning for a flight out to Australia. I'm pretty sure that's what it was. And I'm driving back from the airport, and I'm in the car, and I'm driving by Pearl Harbor, and my, the windows are open, because Hawaii has the most beautiful weather. Right. You don't need air conditioning. So I'm driving by Pearl Harbor. Didn't even look at the time, and, uh, but it was early in the morning. And, uh, and I looked up over Pearl Harbor, and there is a missing man formation flying over, and it is the anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor at the very moment that it happened, which happens every year, but to be lucky enough to be in Hawaii to experience it firsthand and to, uh, you know, to go up to the punch bowl where all those who were killed um, in Hawaii uh, military are buried. Uh, it's a cemetery. It's a national cemetery. Why is it called punch bowl? Because it's a crater. It was okay. all put in a crater, and the crater is literally in the shape of a, um, a punch bowl. So that's how it was referred to. And it's a beautiful memorial on top of it. Spectacular. And matter of fact, speaking of Hawaii Five O, some of the major scenes in the good old days of anybody that remembers Hawaii Five O flash. Uh, lots of scenes of the Punch Bowl and the monuments mm. and the names. White alabaster. It's it's very 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 moving and very impressive. And uh, Hawaii is is a breathtaking place to work in. We used to find ourselves. Remember specifically, fifteen women on the beach. Uh, not in Waikiki. We would always go out where the Hawaiians would go to get away from tourists. And I remember us being on towels and looking at each other and thinking, and my dad had been stationed there on Ford Island, so it meant a lot to me. Uh, he was a PBY. He flew PBY Catalina flying boats. He was a radio man, gunner's, way, gunner's mate. So it all had a lot of history for me. And I remember we're sitting there on our little towels, and we all looked at each other and said, do you believe there <laughs> Paying us to be here, oh. so it was uh, it was an incredible tour. I mean, I did things. Oh, and I also handled congressional delegations. That was a secondary thing when they had an overrun of people. But uh, because of those, even though I used to get annoyed with the congressmen and the senators because they were very, very, very demanding. At the same rate, then and later on in my career, they proved to be the reason that it was a bigger adventure because you have to go with them, mm -hmm. and they want to see everything. And they want to fly in every type of aircraft, fixed wing and rotary wing. So I'm zipping through the lava tubes of the Big Island with a, an open door and a little chain across my waist looking straight down <laughs> at the ground. And the only thing holding me there is um, a kinetic, you know, the gravity of, of swinging aircraft and a little chain across my waist that really wouldn't have held anything. <laughs> and I just remember the uh, congressman, Lindsey Thomas, is uh, from. Uh, Georgia, I think he was, uh, his uh, staffer, senior staffer, who pretty much did all the work. That's how I figure it works in Congress. <laughs> and she was very capable. They are too, but they're too busy to do the actual grunt work. So she said, give me a ride, I'll never forget. <laughs> <laughs> the pilots thought that was a great challenge, so we, we all got a ride. And um, we went over to Maui to look at the um, the observatory, and it's a it's it's a, it displays if you go up to the observatory, it tracks tracks all the objects in space that float, and it, it can tell you where it's going to be at what time. They're all considered satellites in a way, because even even a even a chip of paint is considered a satellite, huh. um, and so they track every single thing up there because it could do in a, a spaceship in about a second. So anyway, it was a great opportunity. Hawaii was incredible. I can't say enough about it. But, um, but anyway, that was a good tour. What happened after Hawaii? Um, I went back to Newport, which is where I was trained, mm -hmm. because I was not quite as satisfied with our company officer as I would like to have been. And I thought, I'm going to do a better job. So I went to be a company officer and instructor at Officer Candidate School mm -hmm. and ended up at OIS, which is Officer Indoctrination School. Mm -hmm. OCS is for the general type coming in like I was. Mm -hmm. OIS, Officer mm -hmm. Indoctrination School, you come in as an officer, a direct commission, and what happens is um, uh, doctors, lawyers, dentists, uh, engineers, specifically nuclear engineers and uh, mechanical engineers, that sort of thing, 
uh, sometimes public affairs officers that come in a direct commission way go to school for six weeks, vice four months, which is what I did. So um, I went there and I went into um, training as an instructor. Uh, company officer, you just learn. You, you, well, you have other people who let you shadow their company and then you learn from them. But instructing, you have to go to school so you can learn how not to hold on to the pencil <laughs> and you know things like this and not to turn your back away from the <laughs> classroom. But anyway, that was only a three-week school. It was just a very basic thing, but it was very helpful. And then um, about, th I think it was um, three, uh, that was three weeks, probably about a month or so into my training. Oh, no, I take it back. It was I had my first company, and they were about to graduate. Um, the, that was in July, August time frame in 1990. And uh, excuse me for a second. Oh, sure. So I, um, what happened? July, August, 1990. Right. Uh, my company came to me, and I had 50 in my company, and they were all, many of them were older than I was, and I went in later. I was 26 when I went in. And um, they had all gone to medical school or nursing school or whatever it might be. And, you know, at first, they were keeping, I was keeping, that's right, they, they let me know the invasion of Kuwait happened in August. And, um, because I was doing crazy hours with them. I was there at four in the morning and so forth. And um, they were going to graduate the next week. So that afternoon, um, I was keeping them now posted because they have no radio. They have nothing. They have to keep their rooms inspection ready or their spaces inspection ready. And so um, I had them out on the grinder. And the grinder literally is to practice marching and drill. What is a grinder? Well, in this case, it was a parking lot. Oh. It was, a con it was okay. a, uh, you know, just an asphalt ca uh, parking lot, but it was right on Narragansett Bay. Okay. And uh, anyway, they, um, I had split them up into 25 and 25 because mm -hmm. they just weren't getting the drill. Mm -hmm. So I split them up and I brought out a video camera and I taped them. And I also had one platoon watch the other platoon. And they were making fun of the other platoon. And I would say, well, let me just say that <laughs> you're not much better. And I had gone to a gunny sergeant to teach me, a Marine Corps gunny sergeant, to teach me how to teach them drill, because I wanted to do it right. So anyway, we're out there. It's Friday afternoon. And, um, and they said, ma'am, can we talk to you? And I said, sure. So uh, we all, they all sort of mustered up. And I'm standing there looking at them all. And they all have these very worried looks on their faces. And I said, what is it? And they said, well, we're just wondering, are we going to go? And I said, what do you mean? And they said, are they going to send us to Saudi Arabia or to Kuwait? Because the invasion had happened <clears throat> about two and a half weeks before. I said, I don't know. I said, the likelihood exists. Excuse me. <clears throat> I said, the likelihood exists, but I, a lot of you would probably back up other people who will go that are already active duty. And I said, but yeah, you could go. It depends on what your specialty is. And I was really shooting from the hip, but it was my gut telling me that, yeah, the potential was there. And they said, what about you? And I laughed at them. I said, no. I said, no, nobody would want me there. I'm, I'm a company officer, and I'm a protocol officer, and I don't have anything really to offer a wartime situation. So no, no, nothing's going to happen. I'm not. No one's going to call me. And uh, so it's Friday afternoon at 4 PM, and that was that. Well, I get back. We had just finished. Oh, we just finished, and it's Friday night, and, uh, and the weekend came. So I never thought anything of it. Why would I? And uh, one of them came to me and said, ma'am, I'm kind of scared. And I said, and I can remember his name, and I won't say it, because he said, I don't know if I can do this. I said, you're going to be fine. I said, don't worry. When you're with a unit, you'll be fine. I said, you may or may not go. And of course, he did go. But Monday, that was Friday, Monday came. And, uh, and it was 4 in the afternoon. And I came back to King Hall, or uh, Nimitz Hall, which is where we had our, our uh, barracks as well as where the staff had their offices. And nobody was there except one other uh, lieutenant, Lieutenant Heinemann. And she was in one office, I was in another. Uh, and she said, Lieutenant uh, Lynch, there's a phone call for you from Washington. And I said, OK. And I'm thinking, my detailer? You know, am I already moving and I don't know? Mm -hmm. And I've only been here a couple of months. So anyway, I got on the phone and there was, and I remember the phone was in my left hand. I remember everything. <laughs> and I remember the phone's in my left hand and I, 
And I, I said, hello, this is Lieutenant Lynch. And she said, hi, this is Commander Howard. Um, you have been selected to go to Saudi Arabia. And I, and I, and of course, I thought my students did it. I thought any number of people. <laughs> I was already slated to sing at two friends' weddings um, that, um, you know, I was going to be singing in September. And so that immediately came to my mind. I thought they're, they're having fun right. with me. So anyway, um, I said, okay, who is this and who put you up to it? Uh. And this woman came back at me and screamed into the phone. She said, Lieutenant Lynch, this is Commander Howard and you are going. Ooh. And I just, my hand started to shake and I just stood there and I couldn't move, I couldn't speak. And I mean, it's not that I wouldn't go, it's not, it just was a shock. And so I sat there and the, anyway, it was unbelievable. <laughs> so Lieutenant Heineman looked at me and I held the phone away. This commander, I'm sure, is wondering what the heck is going on. She's not going, mind you. So I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting there and Lieutenant Heineman said, what's wrong? And I said, I'm going to Saudi Arabia. And I just stood there and she said, okay. And at that time, uh, Captain Earhart came in, who was our CO, commanding officer. And um, he said, what's going on in here? And then the whole staff is coming in. And, and I'm still standing there, and I don't even remember speaking to Commander Johnson, or Commander Howard. I mix her up because of Howard Johnson. Right. Commander Howard, and Lieutenant Heineman says, Lieutenant Lynch is going to Saudi Arabia, and she's a little in shock, and I'm just still holding the phone. Hold the phone. <laughs> and so Captain Earhart says, Lieutenant Lynch, get in my office. I'll handle this. And I said, yes, sir. And I got up and I walked away. I went in his office and I sat in the corner like a three-year-old child. <laughs> I just sat there. I was like, okay. I wonder what's happening to me now. It was the strangest thing. And, uh, and you know, you do, there was a bit of a shock going on in me, physical shock. I mean, I was very aware and alert and all that, but it just was so unexpected. And how weird that my, you know, my class, had, so anyway, I, um, so I went back in and, uh, oh, he came in, that's what it was, and I popped to my seat at attention, popped to my feet at attention, and I said, um, he said to me, uh, Lieutenant Lynch, uh, you're going, it's a done deal. Lieutenant Kastner, help her pack her sea bag. And that was it. So the whole place, the base motiva or, uh, went mobilized and um, ended up getting me a ticket and going and so forth. And that, that's, uh, that whole story, I don't know, it's a big story. I'll try and keep it short. I went. And I went on an American Airlines flight. I was not with a unit. I was by myself. All I had, I had top secret orders that I couldn't take with me. I was only allowed to look at them and then they put them back in a safe at Newport. Somebody else got me a ticket. What were your orders? To go to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Right. And um, with no job title. No job title? No, okay. with no specific location. Mm -hmm. It just said Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. And um, so I just went and, you just, and I didn't get to see my parents. They were the last people I called because I didn't know how I was going to tell them. Because my father's heart was not the best at that time. Oh. And I, I called, I had the gunny who trained me in drill, he yelled at me. He said, how the heck are you going? I've been in this, the Marine Corps for 17 years oh. and I'm not going. I've never, and he was mad. And he wasn't really mad at me. He was mad that he wasn't being sent. And I said, gunny, I, I, <laughs> I don't know what to say. So, um, and everybody was really good when I was leaving and people pulled together really well and I was the only one going. How much notice did you have? 17 hours. Okay. So I, I got called on a, on a Friday and I left by like 11 or noon on, uh, excuse me, called on a Monday and left by Tuesday before noon. And um, that was a shock. So um, I left, went on this flight and flew via Pakistan mm -hmm. and uh, Germany and Pakistan mm -hmm. and and there were a lot of military on the flight they were all men and they were all together and very sort mm -hmm. of covetous of, of their space it turned out they would they were the Navy strike team that would fly off the decks of the carriers to do the bombing raids but um, I didn't meet them the whole time all I saw was women in um, well I assumed they were women in black uh, yeah. cloaks and so forth and that was the beginning of a whole new world. Um, these women were going to Saudi Arabia and they looked normal. Uh, it, they looked normally dressed. But we, when we were a half hour from landing, um, I had met this, uh, everybody changed. The women all put the whole black obaya, everything covering their faces, everything. And um, I'm trying to think. 
oh, I had met a woman who claimed she sat next to me. It was the only other woman on the, on the plane that was uh, non-Saudi or non-Arab. And uh, this woman sat there, and I'm wearing a uh, white blouse above my elbows, I think, and a black skirt, a long black skirt. It was a fluke. Mm -hmm. And then it had sort of a little bit of a V-neck, but nothing major. And the, um, what ended up happening? She said to me, why are you here? Why are you going to Saudi Arabia? And I said, I'm a Navy lieutenant. And she said, um, I said, who, what do you do? And she was going to Pakistan. Um, and she said, I work for the State Department. And it occurred to me as we talked, she works for the CIA. Right. And so she said, you can't look like that. So I had to start covering up. And she gave me a paper clip. And she clipped my uh, blouse together. And then we, you know, and that was that. And then she left. And then I never saw her again. Got to the airport and um, really didn't, I was in sort of shock then. I can remember it, but I feel like I was in a haze and a daze. And, and I went in and I was in the airport. Um, all I saw were men, and then a, one woman, I again assume because there was a hand coming out, but you couldn't see the hand because it had a black glove, and a little child was attached to the oh. hand. And it looked somewhere between a very old-fashioned nun with a dark covering and Darth Vader. That's the effect, and oh. I was scared to death. And I thought, what am I doing here? I don't, I don't even know where I'm going. So I saw a group of what looked like Americans, and I walked up. And I said to this fellow, I, I started to cry because I didn't know what was next. And I'm in a completely foreign country. And I went in and um, uh, I went up to one fellow and I said, um, excuse me, are you an American? He said, yes, I am. And he said, are you OK? And I said, no. <laughs> and he, said, he said, well, stick with me. And he said, what are you doing here? And, I, and everybody said, what are you doing here? You know, nobody said, oh, where are you from? It's like, <laughs> What are you doing here? And I said, I am um, here. I'm a Navy lieutenant. He goes, wow, that's amazing. And I said, well, what are you going to do? <laughs> and uh, I wasn't as casual as I sound now, trust yeah. me. And then I'm at the end of a long line of men who he said, stick with us. I said, he said, we're all one unit. We're Air Force. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, the ma I'm a major. And he said, uh, we'll take care of you. And I said, OK. Had no passport. All I had was a military ID. Why and, um, had you no passport? Because uh, I never had one, and they couldn't get me one, and oh. so an ID and travel orders right. would allow me to travel without a passport. Now I realize it was only after that I realized what a big deal that was. Mm -hmm. So, and I landed at a commercial airport. I wasn't on a military mm -hmm. airport, um, so it was a big deal. I was behind this group, and I, you know, finally somebody at the front who looked to me from protocol experience looked like an Air Force Colonel. And he looked at me and he said, uh, what are you doing here? You don't belong with us. <laughs> and I just got the wide-eyed look again. And, and the major piped in. He said, Colonel, she's a Navy lieutenant, and she does belong here. And then he turned around, and the whole line turned around and looked at me. And the colonel said, damn it, they're sending women. This is unbelievable. <laughs> and that was my, you know. So anyway, I went through, and I was immediately set upon by all these men with, um, what you, where is your husband? Where is your husband? Where is your husband? And I just, and I kind of like shied away. And uh, I was, well, all I was doing was getting a cart for my sea bag mm -hmm. and a few other things. I lost touch with these other guys because they were stuck. Nobody wanted to talk to me. They just waved me through because I was a woman. Mm -hmm. And so when I went through, all these men descended. The one thing that woman did tell me is do not take a um, cab, a taxi, take a limousine. It's identical vehicle, but one says limo and the other says taxi. And never take a taxi because it's not certified. And she did mention that what would happen is that um, this isn't good PR for Saudi Arabia, right. but, but it, it, uh, they would give a down payment to the um, taxi cab driver and uh, expect him to return, like four or $500, and expect him to return with a, a European woman. And she would, when he delivered the European woman, which would be anybody mm. practically that was not an Arab, mm. uh, could be an American, whatever, mm. uh, that they would. Um, deliver the woman to the, the one who gave the down payment, and they'd get the rest of their money. And then the woman would disappear from anywhere from a day to forever. And it was sort of a, I can't say call it white slavery exactly, but I guess you could call it oh. in a way. So you knew that was the only thing she did say to me to warn me. So I saw all these people when I, I was waved through customs, waved through immigration. Just no one wanted to deal with me, got into a cab, and uh, I mean, 
excuse me, a limousine, which is a little Nissan Sentra, mm -hmm. and uh, or started to. I take it back, and I was I was falling apart. I was really mm -hmm. this was not. I didn't have any expectations. I didn't plan to go, and um, and I didn't certainly plan to go by myself to a very and I say very foreign where the the cultural differences are great. So I went and. Um, and ended up, I came outside and I looked for the, anybody that looked familiar and I said to a man, I said, are you by any chance a military? And he said, yes I am. Totally new person, waiting for his relief to come. And I said, I'm an American lieutenant in the Navy, I don't know where I'm supposed to be, my orders don't give me any information. I said, I don't know what to do. He said, stay with me, I'll take care of you. He then took me home with his relief when he came through. We drove to the what's called the Rock Compound. It's the foreign military sales compound, he's permanent. And he handed me, um, as soon as I walked in the door, he locked the doors and he said, here's the phone. It was a satellite phone. He said, call your parents immediately. Let them know you're okay. Mm -hmm. And then he put in front of me a Heineken beer oh. and, a, and, a, and, of course, it's illegal. Yeah. It's, so that's why I locked the doors because yeah. the, uh, the police, the religious police. So anyway, um, so that was uh, the beginning. And people put, we didn't know I belonged. He called all night. He was up all night trying to find out where I belonged. All it said was Riyadh, Saudi Arabia on my orders. How did they I expect you to find? I have no idea. I really don't know. And it turns out I was due at Central Command headquarters. Mm -hmm. And that was um, in Riyadh. Um, God, it's, it's, I need, I need my notes. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, it was, what happened? Oh, I went to the hotel where everybody was going to. There were two hotels, and I think I went to the Marriott first. And again, you're in the twilight zone. There's, it runs 24 hours. All these military are coming into Riyadh, and they're feeding them all hours of the night. And I remember scrambled eggs being the main course, usually. And, um, and there were three or four people to each room. And I remember one woman. My roommate, who I had met at that time, it's two bedroom, and it's only supposed to have two people. And I just remember I, I woke up and there was someone walking in the room, and I, she said, "Hi, how are you?" And I said, "I don't know." And she <laughs> said, "I know what you mean. I've been here for two days, and it feels like a lifetime." Oh. And she said, "You know, it's all so different." And um, I said, "What do you do?" And she said, "I'm the nuclear biological chemical officer for Central Command." <laughs> And it just hit me that we're in a possible war zone and all that was going to matter a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, I finally went, uh, I met her the next morning. They started giving me pieces of different people's uniforms because I, my Lieutenant Kastner, who was told to pack my sea bag, gave me my service dress whites, my service dress blues, which is a full sea bag, my khakis, my cotton khakis, my CNT khakis my summer whites in cotton and khaki, or, or cotton and CNT, certi certified navy twill mm -hmm. by DuPont. <laughs> um, nobody likes it. And um, anyway, what ended up happening? Uh, I had no camouflage, because I'm in the Navy. Mm -hmm. So they had to give me camouflage, desert camouflage. And um, I had, I wore Captain Richardson's top, I wore somebody else's bottoms, I wore someone else's boots, <laughs> and I was an Air Force captain for a week. <laughs> and, um, and everybody was calling me Captain Richardson, so it was kind of funny. But, um, but they did find where I belonged, at least they thought they did, and there was this Captain Doyle, as I think was his name, that this uh, foreign mer military sales colonel had finally found where I belonged. Everybody thought I belonged in Bahrain because that's where the Navy was, right. Navy Central Command. And um, so this fellow, and the, wor the hardest part about the whole trip was the beginning. That was the, the most memorable uh, for the most part. Um, so I, almost most memorable, um, so I ended up, uh, he came picked me up, came and picked me up, and we went, he said, I'm going to take you to the Royal, uh, Royal Saudi Naval Forces Building. Mm -hmm. He said, now, um, that's what we're going to bring you. He said, you're supposed to go to Central Command, but Admiral Wright wants you there. I said, okay, and I was just saying okay to anything at this point. And I remember that one of my first memories, strangely enough, was looking at the numbers and thinking I'm in Saudi Arabia, but they don't use Arabic numerals. Yeah. And they're Indian numerals, so I'm looking at the license plates of the cars. And we walk in and, oh, I neglected one thing. Um, when, I, when this uh, colonel and his replacement took me from the airport, the biggest eye-opening 
experience for me uh, at that time and probably for quite a long time was in strange. Uh, we were going into the um, into the garage, and of course the air con the air conditioning's on everywhere. Of course, and it's nine o'clock at night, as I recall, when I finally connected with him and went to the air a garage. Well, we went from the airport inside to the garage outside, and it was, you know, multi-level garage, but it was not inside, it was not air conditioned. And I remember the doors, the three of us walked through and the doors opened out, and I just took a breath, thinking I was going to be able to, and there was nothingness. And it was like a hot blast of air from the center of the earth, oh. and it was 130 degrees with absolutely no humidity, and I couldn't breathe. It was oh. the strangest thing, and I just went, <gasps> It was, I can't explain it. You, you adjust eventually, but it, it was like going way, way high on a mountain. You can't breathe. And of course I was breathing, but I felt like I wasn't. So that was the beginning. The next day they take me to uh, Royal Saudi Naval F uh, Forces Building, and this Captain Doyle and I are walking together. And he was like my, you know, I, I had a lot of heroes over there because I was so, I was scared. I, I won't deny it. I mean, it sounds kind of wimpy. It wasn't World War II. It wasn't Korea. It wasn't anything yet. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was scared, and it was, a, it was tough for me. And I had no unit. I was by myself. So, um, and everyone else went with units. So anyway, I, um, so I went in to, um, oh, we were outside the building. We were about 10 paces from two men who were greeting us, I thought. And he said, oh, by the way, he said, I want you to know something. They've never seen a, a military woman here. He said, and actually, we had to get special permission uh, to, to allow you in the building. And I had to meet with, uh, or, or Admiral Wright had to meet with uh, Prince Khalid, I think it was, uh, to allow you in the building. There's never been a woman in this building. Oh. And so I just looked at him, and this is seconds before two guys come out with guns pointed at me and say she can't go in. And he's, and he's saying, Nakib, Nakib, which is captain, which is Navy right. lieutenant, but right. the uh, translation. Right. And, um, and they just kept looking at him like, what are you doing? What are you doing? She's not allowed in here. Where's her husband? <laughs> right. And so I just stood there, and I'm, and I'm, gonna, I'm all right with him. But yeah. I was, you know, it was just one more little not, you know. So we got through that, and they looked at me, and they kept staring at my ID and turning it over like something was going to come to light. And I just stood there, and I was not <laughs> smiling. But anyway, so we went in. Finally, they let us in. And the building was spectacular, beautiful, grand staircase and this incredible chandelier. And, and which building is this? This is the Royal Saudi Naval Forces Building. Okay. And... Um, so we went in and we walked up this grand staircase to the second floor and that was, um, we were the only Americans in the building because it was the Royal Saudi building, but there was a small contingent over in the corner and it was the Naval uh, Nav Sent Riyadh, Navy Central Command Riyadh, mm -hmm. went in, immediately was taken into Admiral Wright's office. He said, I don't know what the hell they brought you here for, Karen. And he said, <laughs> I'm happy to have you, but he said, you're supposed to go up to Central Command because everybody had been talking about me by now. Yeah. And he said, we were supposed to send you up to Central Command Headquarters, which is just down the street, but we're not going to do that. We don't think you can do your job. I said, what is my job? And he said, you're supposed to be a protocol officer here in, in Saudi Arabia. And oh. he said, we don't think you can do that. Why? Because I'm a woman, Why? and they won't deal with me. Right. And, um, and I just stood there, and I never argued with an admiral before. Yeah. I given a few with a couple of pains in the side, probably, but I'd always been extremely dutiful and very rules oriented not to rock the boat. That was me. That's why I did well in protocol. Mm -hmm. I was never fired because I always thought of every angle and I treated people with tremendous respect, which is why I didn't get fired, but I also politically mm -hmm. I was in good shape. And I don't even want to put it that way, but I was very cordial. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I went in and uh, and, and you know, he sat me down. He said, I don't know what was on their mind, but he said, what we're going to do is we're going to keep you here. We're going to have you do admin. Mm -hmm. And I just looked at him. And I thought, I'm worried about my father having a heart attack because I left. My parents are in severe pain over this. I was uprooted. I had to find somebody to rent my apartment in 17 hours. Mm -hmm. And you're going to keep me here and make, you can see my blood pressure going up. <laughs> you're going to make me do admin. You're not even going to let me do what I can do, which is protocol. Mm -hmm. I didn't say that, of course. Right. I just felt it. And I looked at him and I said, sir, I'd really like the opportunity to, to at least try it. And if I can't succeed, then come over. And I'd never done that before. And it sounds like no big deal, but believe me, it yeah. was. And I said, um, I'd like to have that opportunity. And he said, I'm sorry, Karen, I can't let you do it. He said, but I'll tell you what, um, we'll talk about it later. But either way, we've got a 10 o'clock briefing. We're having a top secret briefing on the um, air assaults. 
and that will be upcoming. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I've left, I've left my planet, you know. So anyway, we, um, he said, uh, by the way, um, they don't have ladies' rooms here, so you can use my bathroom. Mm -hmm. And so I said, all right, thank you, sir. And he said, or the head. Yeah. And I said, okay. And he said, um, so we got to go to that meeting in 10 minutes, so be there. And, the, and everybody's trying to take good care of me, which I appreciated. And he was looking out for me. That was his intention. But it um, just wasn't coming to me. I wanted to do what I came for if I was going to be there anyway. And uh, anyway, so we went to the, uh, the, the call to prayer started, which I didn't even understand at first. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell, tell us what call to prayer is. Uh, call to prayer is, uh, they happen five times a day. Uh, it starts about 20 minutes before the prayers actually begin. But since it's a Muslim country, and they actually don't even officially allow any other religions, nor you'd have to pe keep it pretty clandestine if you did celebrate any other religion. Um, but anyway, the call to prayers would be to let you know that it was time to begin to get washed, to clean your feet, to clean your hands, mm -hmm. to clean yourself before you go to prayers. You have to come very clean to prayers. So finish up whatever work you're doing and then they have call to prayers again um, to, to say, you know, it's like five minutes away. And so anyway, um, I said to this officer, I can't remember his name now, I said, I've, he said, let's go to the... Uh, well, let's go to the meeting. I said, I've got to tell you, I have to use the, the head. Right. And he said, okay. He said, I'll take you. Or, or he said, okay. And of course I went in and the admiral's taking a shower. Oh. <laughs> and so I turned around and I just looked at him. He said, I'll take care of this. He said, come with me. Went down the hall to a section that was not American per se. And he said, let me check it out first. And it's much, much nicer in the uh, ladies and men's rooms of, of Saudi Arabia, unless they're old, which yeah. is a pit in the ground. But um, but they're much more uh, private, even the men's rooms. And I have visited a few men's rooms in my days of going to <laughs> Irish pubs. But anyway, the men's room, uh, so he went in, he came out, he said, coast is clear. Well, I went in and the stalls are floor to ceiling, mm -hmm. pretty much. And I guess he said something or something and there's nobody there and he tried to look under and you really can't. But anyway, long story made short, it's what you think. <laughs> and they have these sort of um, shower sets uh, set ups, not like, floor to ceiling showers but it's a nozzle that you can ha use your hand and you can wash your feet and there's a drain and it's meant for the prayers it's it, in other words to get you ready for going to prayers so um, and then uh, I was finished and I'm standing I'm just about ready to leave and I hear somebody out there washing and I know I can't leave because they would have absolute cardiac arrest nobody knew I was in the building right. except the prince yeah and the two guards outside. So I waited and waited. And I also knew we were about to be late for the meeting. Long story short, um, I was in there another 15 minutes, standing in the stall, waiting for this man to leave. Mm -hmm. And so, because I thought he might pass out. <laughs> so anyway, the commander came in and got me. He said, I am so sorry. He said, he must have been in here and I didn't know. So we went to the meeting. And it was a top secret meeting and it was the most amazing. I could not believe I was in the room for it. And I, can't discuss it, but mm -hmm. it was it was amazing, and I could not believe not what I was hearing that I was privy to more than that. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so uh, after that meeting was over, uh, I, Admiral got a call from uh, General Horner, who was standing in till General Schwarzkopf got there. Mm -hmm. General Horner is a four-star Air Force general who was standing in. Uh, this is there is uh, they began to call uh, Central Command is in the Middle East. But Central Command Tampa is where most people exist. So they began to call Central Command Riyadh or Central Command, and they would call Tampa, which is the headquarters, mm -hmm. uh, Central Command Tampa, because or McDill Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. So we became the main stay. That's that. It's a mobile group. It, you're you're really not supposed to be in Florida. That's why well, there's nothing going on. So anyway, um, I forget where I was going with that one. So I left, we got a call from General Horner, uh, not himself, but someone, and saying send, send her up there. And they basically said, get her ass up there, is what they said. Mm -hmm. And so Admiral Wright said, Karen, I'm trying to protect you. I said, it's all right, sir, don't worry about it. They drove me back over, and that's the day I started. And, um, and to, to make the shorter version of it, um, it was the most amazing, the whole thing was the most amazing story of my life. So what was your job? You take, I was the, the protocol. Started. That was the day I really started in my job. So my they job, really let you be protocol. Yeah. Okay. And uh, my job was protocol, and mm -hmm. ultimately it was going to be for um, General Schwarzkopf. Mm -hmm. He had not arrived in country yet. He he did not come until September. Mm -hmm. So I'm. It's not even three weeks into the invasion of Kuwait. 
me and the 82nd Airborne have dropped, no, a few other people yeah. there. And I'm here for what reason? Protocol. Yeah. And I couldn't understand it. And I, find, and I asked everybody, and I came to work for um, Charlie Bramlett, who was a captain in the Air Force, who was uh, General Schwarzkopf's original protocol officer and sort of deputy chief of protocol. Um, and I said, can I ask you, Charlie, why are we here? And as a protocol office, and he said, and we became Joint Visitors Bureau. Mm -hmm. And um, he said because Secretary of Defense Cheney was here, and the embassy screwed up big time, and they needed oh. protocol officers. We were going to come anyway, but we wanted they wanted us here now, and yeah. they wanted more. So they had we ultimately had four or five protocol officers there, only two of whom had any experience, Charlie and myself. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, so that was the um, that was the beginning, and what it was is handling the visits of generals, admirals, whomever, uh, and many, 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 many congressional delegations. The ones who would decide what our camouflage uniform was, <clears throat> the ones who would decide whether we'd go to war or not, and the ones that I would privately curse because they made my life miserable. But they are not all of them. A lot of them were wonderful. Mm. <clears throat> But a lot of them made my life miserable because, in one particular instance, we were in the um, <clears throat> Emir's Palace in Bahrain, which is a separate country, and he invited two groups from the House and the Senate. Did you say the Emir's yes, Palace? Yes, Emir, okay. yes, right. Sheikh Mohammed, right. um, who happened to love Americans. Mm. Saudis loved the French, mm. um, the uh, Bahrainis loved Americans and British, and um, so. Uh, Sheikh Mohammed uh, was having, uh, the Emir of Bahrain, of the state of Bahrain, uh, was having a dinner. And he decided, since he knew both groups were in town at the same time, he would have a dinner at the palace. And it moved from palace to palace to palace. And finally, he happens to own a um, Sheraton. But it's a private Sheraton. It's his Sheraton. So he ended up having it at the... Sh no, I take it back. The Senate was staying at his Sheraton. The house was staying at the Hilton across the street. Mm. Somehow they found out they were, well, no, neither one of them knew the other was there. And somehow, because of the invitations, of course they're going to find out we all show up at the same dinner together, which was making me miserable because I knew what was going to happen. There were 200 of us there at a U-shaped table. And there was an ambassador, a royal ambassador, which he was the ambassador of protocol. This We don't have that here. Mm. I would say the closest thing we have is the chief of protocol, protocol. for the president. Mm. Uh, but this, fa this man is an actual ambassador, and I don't think it's a bad idea now that I think of it. Mm -hmm. um, he was lovely, lovely. He wore a suit, which is unusual. The emir wore his traditional garb. But um, I remember briefing the congressional delegations, and they interspersed them. They put Congress with Senate, so they chatted. Well, that's another story, which I'll tell in a second. But what also happened is certain individuals um, were not feeling well. They had been on a C-140 earlier in the day as part of their tour. And they had their own trip that I had planned for them. One would go in one direction. They specifically wanted to see certain Army and Marine Corps, and the other wanted to see Navy and Marine Corps and Air Force or whatever. So they had completely different itineraries. We were able to keep them apart until the Emir decided to have the dinner. So what happened was several of them had been in a rough, had spent a rough day at 140 degree temperature on a plane. And so they were a little worse for the wear, and it was showing. So one of them came up to me and he said, I wonder if I could pro pe perhaps go home. And this is, this is a senator. I said, certainly, sir, we can arrange that. And we had, the Bahrainis had given us all Mercedes. Uh, I mean, each and every, everybody got a Mercedes. And we had the, you know, the Jeeps with the guys up top. These are not our, our military, theirs with the machine guns and everything. This, well, anyway, and each one got that. You know, they all came over together in a cavalcade or uh, convoy in a sense, but on the way home there were a couple of people who left early, so the ambassador came rushing over and he said, is everything all right? And I said, um, uh, Senator so-and-so is not feeling well and would like to go home. He said, so we both led him out to the front and I had briefed them on what they could and could not do and should and should not do. Mm -hmm. And you get, I'm, I'm, I'm hardly egotistical, but you do begin to get sort of bold when you're dealing with multitudes of congressmen senators and their staffers who can be very demanding and ask for things that they should not ask for and um, and sometimes they're literally impossible and you I really go all out to try and make it happen 
But it was a terrible faux pas when this, the second senator decided when we, we put him, we put the first senator in a, in a Mercedes and sent him home. I said, would you like me to go with you? He said, no, 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 I'll be fine. And the second senator came and he too was not feeling well. And they weren't, you could tell. But anyway, we go out to the, uh, the front and I call the men in waiting. There are all these men in beautiful, spectacular um, uh, 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 thobes and gutras, that's the wrong pronunciation, but women wore abayas, the men wore these beautiful white or off-white uh, uh, robes with um, gold, and it's 24 karat gold sewn mm -hmm. into, the, um, into the outfit, and a beautiful under uh, outfit, and the, the thobe and the, and the gutra, or the thobe is the dress and the gutra is this whole head thing. But anyway, and I know I'm saying it wrong, but either way, um, these men would just stay around and wait, like I, I imagine ladies in waiting would do. And so I referred to them as the men in waiting. Well, the ambassador and I came out to the front with the senator and the car, we're waiting for the car to come up. And one of these men in waiting is standing there in this fabulous outfit. And um, he just looks spectacular. And they're very handsome men, many of them, just terribly handsome. And um, it was just a scene. And um, so anyway, the senator looked at him and he looked at what he was wearing and I knew what was coming. He just looked at the man and he went with his hand and I go, oh, I know what's happening. And he just said, that is a beautiful outfit. Touched it? He didn't touch it. Oh, but yeah. when you say, when you admire something in Saudi Arabia oh, or Bahrain, it it's you. yours. Oh. And so I, I looked at him and I just, I, I did, I gave him a glare. I yeah. thought, I don't believe you just did that. Yeah. And the ambassador said immediately, it is yours. Yeah. And um, he said, what we will do is we will present you another one <clears throat> through the embassy in Washington. Yeah. And these cost thousands oh. of dollars. They're handmade, and it's 24 karat gold. Oh. So anyway, we sent him home, and that was that. But it was an amazing evening. It was probably a 13-course meal, and I couldn't believe I was even invited, which normally protocol, when you're in protocol, you're not invited to things. You don't always, you're usually standing at the back of the room. But it was an amazing experience. And then we went into another room later, and we drank juice and coffee and, uh, you know, the uh, aromatic coffee with the coffee. Uh, it's, a, it's a clear green drink, mm. and it's very ceremonial. It doesn't taste like coffee at all. It's not ground. Mm. It, they boil the beans. Mm -hmm. There's no grinding about it. And it's in a very small ceremonial china cup. And, um, and the, uh, many people are familiar with the brass coffee urns. Yes. And it generally has straw to strain out any extra cardamom or anything that might overflavor the coffee. And in Saudi Arabia, you have tea boys and coffee men. The tea boys, you know, so, so anyway, we're having tea we're ha or coffee, we're having dates, you know, you dip the dates in the water and, mm -hmm. and you drink the coffee. And the two together are a nice combination, mm -hmm. though, and it's very perfumey. The cardamom made it very perfumey. Never really liked it, but I always, of course, mm -hmm. drank it. Um, but it was kind of fun. It was part of the whole experience, which overall I adored, but um, was, a, you know, so we left. And I do remember one thing that sort of, that de definitely impressed me, and that was the, um, they brought out the incense. And uh, frankincense, by the way, is one of the most expensive incense. Uh, and it's cured wood, and, and, um, and obviously a scent is part of it. But um, they brought out the incense, and it was burning. And, it's in, and what you do is, if you are in your private home, uh, the women would, the women would be in the women's room, men would be in their area, the dining room, um, and the women would, you know, because they're with women, they can take their veils off and everything else, and they would pull their hair out and put the, put the um, scent in the smoke into their hair and then their robes, and that's what everybody was doing. So if somebody brought it over to you, you would sort of bring it to you with one or two hands. And so anyway, um, that was an amazing experience to watch this, and I'm thinking, I'm in a palace, I'm in Bahrain, <laughs> I'm living what is basically 2,000 years ago. I had a very unmilitary experience throughout, with some exception, obviously. And um, so anyway, we left there, and that, that was one of the uh, anecdotes that uh, will, will stay with me, and it, it's probably more to it than that. But anyway, it was a great evening uh, for me overall, for obvious reason. And uh, everybody got back unscathed, and it went very well. But um, uh, I don't know. There are, I don't know how much you want to. Well, I understand you worked with, did the war books for General Schwarzkopf, and I yes. wanted you to tell me what that meant. And okay. Um, well, during the time in Desert Shield before the uh, before the war, 
my whole function was congressional delegations mm -hmm. and, uh, and lots of firsts for being a woman, interestingly enough. Once the war began, it was a different story. Um, my function disappeared because almost disappeared. When you say the war began, you meant we went from Operation Desert Shield, Desert Shield to Desert, Desert, Operation Desert Storm. Which was the liberation of Kuwait. Right, right. the beginning. The beginning and of um, what happened was um, the first night of, uh, I'm thinking, General de la Billiere, who was commander of the British forces, would come on an evening basis, 7 p.m. each evening. Mm -hmm. And we would be giving briefings, as I recall, but they, were, they really sped, there were many more once the war began. So General de la Billiere would come over with his aide and a very strapping couple of people. He, very handsome man and uh, very, you know, uh, just in charge. And his aide would be with me. And so we'd stay up in the protocol offices. And, um, and I remember that particular night. I sat there, and he said to me, how'd you get those camel boots? Because you're always trading with the Saudis. <laughs> I, and I had these rather nice camel-colored boots. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, if you play your cards right, <laughs> you uh, might have some luck with me. I might be able to talk some of these guys into it. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, we all wore the, um, the black boots, the jungle boots, and they just were too hot. These were meant for hot weather. So I said, I'll see what I can do. And I said, what about you? Where did you get that sash as part of your uniform? That's a pretty nice sash. <laughs> Anyway, that particular night, he came into me and he looked at me, and of course he's looking around just like this, there's nobody there. The only reason, I usually worked 7.30 to 11 p.m. every night, seven days a week. That's just how it was. It's just your existence. So how, what were your hours again? 7.30 in the morning till 11 p.m. every night. And, um, and I had no days off. The only day off I had was Jan uh, January 12th. And it was, um, it was that, the day was the day that there was a threat so everybody had to stay in. So I couldn't even do anything. I stayed in my hotel room. So I, I remember going, um, oh, so I'm standing there chatting with Mark. I think his name was Mark Chapman, uh, Major Mark Chapman. Um, and he said to me, do you know what's happening? And I said, what? It's January 16th. And I said, what? And he said, um, something's happening tonight. And I said, is it beginning? You know, we, very few of us knew what was happening because mm -hmm. We were surrounded by Yemenian uh, people who were very anti-American, anti-Saudi, and worked in the bakeries, and you'd be, you, you don't know who you're talking to. Uh, the Saudis were not an issue, although uh, uh, there are a number of people you wouldn't want to tell something to. So they didn't tell us anything. Uh, I was privy to a lot of things in the beginning, and then sometimes during the war I became much more privy. But that time, so long story short, um, I said, I saw a stack of flash message traffic in the uh, office and I wondered what was going on. And flash message traffic is cables, uh, basically what you and I would consider telegrams or cables, um, and they have four different priorities. I think it's routine, uh, priority, immediate, and flash. And flash, I had never seen one because it's only in wartime. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I saw a stack of flash message was unbelievable. And he said, it's going to start tonight, and he told me what time. And I said, um, okay. And we just looked at each other. And, and I couldn't tell anyone. And so I just sat there and he said, I know, it's kind of unbelievable, isn't it? We know when it's going to start. It's the air war. We knew the air war was going to start. And so, so I went home that night and had my usual onion soup in my room. I would flip between. I lived in a hotel across the street um, from the MODA, Ministry of Defense and Aviation, which is the equivalent to the American, uh, a Saudi Pentagon, if you will, and that's where all the uh, headquarters people were. So I remember going home and thinking, I wonder what's going to happen. And the press is all in. The hotel that I was in were all, was where all the in press had uh, come, and they were also in Dahran, where people saw that from television. Um, and all the Kuwaiti families that had escaped were all living in our hotel. Mm -hmm. So it was about 60 military at that time, and um, press, and, uh, and Kuwaiti families. So, um, anyway, I think we, are we running out of time, maybe? No. No? Oh, no. Oh, okay. No, all right. No. All right. <laughs> We're always fussing about the camera. Oh, all right. No, okay. Um, but anyway, um, so, so I had made friends with a lot of the press at this point, and that's a dangerous thing because they all want details, yeah. and can you tell me, and can you set me up with an interview with General Schwarzkopf? <laughs> somebody from Inside Edition actually offered me a, um, uh, I think it was during the war, offered me a, a date with... <laughs> Um, Geraldo Rivera's, Craig Rivera, and he lives across from me up in the hotel, and I'm thinking, 
<laughs> thank you, but no, thank you. I'm not going to tell you when the war. Oh, that was for the the ground war. He said, yeah. "I know you know. You can tell me. I'll set you up with this." And I said, <laughs> <laughs> oh, "I thought, how desperate can they be?" But anyway, um, and it was a constant barrage. But anyway, so what happened was, so I went to bed, and I remember waking up to the sound of very heavy aircraft. And what it was was the, K the KC-135 mm -hmm. refueling tankers, because the aircraft air uh, port was right near where I lived, right. and uh, it was an air base. And all these KC-135s were going up, and they were there to refuel the fighter aircraft and the um, you know the, anybody dropping bombs, so and the B-17s and everything. Mm -hmm. B uh, yeah, and uh, or B-52. We had everything. But anyway. Um, and I remember the, the whole building re, uh, vibrated, and I, I remember sitting up, and I have my mask, my chemical mask, and my, my mop gear, which is the whole outfit. And I'm just sitting there thinking, wow, this is it. This is it. And I didn't know what to do. You know, I'm in, lying in bed, and I'm waiting for whatever's going to happen to happen. And, all I can, and I know what's happening. The planes are going to refuel the uh, attacks that are about to take place. Mm -hmm. So I heard it before it began, which is kind of weird. And then at 3 o'clock in the morning, my friend, who, a Saudi friend, who had interviewed me for radio and television, not television, for uh, radio and other things for a ladies program, who is now still one of my best friends, um, called me. And I, and I remember just jutting up in bed, getting my mask and putting it in hand, and then picking up the phone and saying, yes. Just, you know, like, what, what's happening? And so anyway, she said, Karen, it's begun. Mm -hmm. And she was watching television at the time, and they were dropping bombs. And, uh, and again, you just very strange feeling from going from sort of peace to a war, small war, but nonetheless. And the next thing you know is we're being hit with uh, scuds. So the alarm starts going, and I'm running, and we go down to the basement where I'm sure that a scud is going to hit the top of the building. It's going to disintegrate the building and it's going to crush us below mm. and this happened on a daily basis and Did the scuds hit your building ne we never actually got hit right. this is just what i imagine right. we had i remember when i when i gained my composure i would go up to the uh, to the roof where you saw all the media and uh, and where they would film from you could s most of the filming you saw from riyadh was at the air base to watch the patriot missiles shoot right. off to meet the uh, scuds. the scuds and unfortunately, I'm sorry to admit, but I guess it's, it's out now that a number of these, the Scud went down and the Patriot followed it and exploded it practically on the ground or in the ground mm -hmm. and made it much worse, unfortunately. But that was not the norm. Um, it did do a lot of good, but unfortunately it, it did some damage too, and I'm sure it was the cause of some people dying. And the, uh, the statistics were wrong. And you asked me what I did with the war book, and a big part, as soon as the war began, my next job was to compile um, what is referred to as the war book, and what it was is a, uh, a, um, a notebook, basically, or mm -hmm. binder, that right. was given to General Schwarzkopf twice a day. Mm -hmm. It was also given to the uh, commander of Saudi forces, as well as commander of British forces. The French were not invited into the war room regularly mm -hmm. for the briefings because they were not completely on for the whole thing. So we could not include them in everything. And um, what was the purpose of the war book? The war book would have all the little bit of history mm -hmm. of what had been going on, but also the plans and operations. Well, I'll, I'll break it down okay. quickly for you. It had J1 through J8, mm -hmm. J1 being joint staff. Mm -hmm. One would be manpower information. Mm -hmm. uh, J2 would be intelligence, okay. uh, like CIA, DIA. They were in country when the pilots went down. We had people on the ground in Kuwait and in uh, Iraq. And so we would get intelligence. And I was privy to all of it. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe not all of it, but I mean pretty much anything that went in the war book I was privy to. So um, J2, OK, so we get J, J1 manpower. J2 is intelligence, which is big. J3 is another big one, operations. That's what's ongoing. That's the attacks. That's the, uh, you know, whatever we were doing, whether it was aircraft or ships or whatever, um, and bombs uh, we would be involved in. And J3 was logistics and security assistance, but mainly logistics. In other words, we were still, by the time the war started, we were still bringing people in. And that was a big concern. Could we get enough people in country, in the theater of operation, in order to begin a war? 
And I guess that's how they surmised when we could re realistically do what we needed to do. Um, so we had enough people in place. We had enough. A lot of army came via aircraft, but also the equipment came by ships. They had to, most right. of the. Uh, so we had to make sure those logistical things were in, including the people themselves. So that's J4. J5 is plans and policy, which really is before the war. That's the planning stage. J6 is command, communications, and uh, control. So it would be computers, it would be all our communication systems, and, uh, and also I'm trying to think, I think operations also included, the J3 also included information on weather, which I always thought was fascinating. We had green, yellow, and red. The green would be beautiful weather for dropping bombs. <laughs> it's awful to say, Sorry. but it's true. No, yeah, I know, it's, it, yeah. but it, you know. And yellow would be hazy, not mm -hmm. good, not great, uh, but potential. And red would be, we can't do the attack today. Right. And you look like you had a question, did you? Oh, I wanted to ask you, uh, what, did you have direct contact with General Schwarzkopf? Oh, yeah. yeah. All and what, the time. what was he like? Um, he was extremely gentle with me. He was old-fashioned, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, he was, had a bit of a little ego. He did. Not with me again. Yeah. He's a very, uh, he's, his presence, he's a huge man. And I say huge, he's 6'4", 6 6'5". 6 and while he was there, he lost 50 pounds. Um, but he also had strained his neck, and so he wore a brace that nobody saw on television, uh -huh. but he'd wear the rest of the time um, because of the stress. Uh, he was a... He was lovely to me, and before the war began, you know, uh, and when we were doing trips, he would, uh, I remember one particular day, uh, he'd ask me to brief him on something. Now, every day I'd pass him, and he'd say, good morning, Lieutenant Lynch, and very formal, yeah. but always extremely nice to me, and I always gave him a big smile, and I said, good morning, General Schwarzkopf, and I'd see him two or three times a day and occasionally brief him. And um, hardly an intelligence briefing, I was, I was the softer side. Mm -hmm. Well, we had SECNAV, Secretary of the Navy, H. Lawrence Garrett III, coming in, and um, I was doing the briefing. And I remember saying to Charlie Bramlett, you know, this is a different level of briefing. I was, I was joint briefing before, but this was me alone. So they had the morning meeting every day at 10 a.m., and by 11 o'clock, then the rest could come in. We were not supposed to be in there. It was uh, classified or top secret at that point. And it was all the generals. It was commander of the Air Force, all the Americans, no foreign at all, no British, no, no one, nothing. It was a very um, in-house thing. So um, I just remember that particular day. One of the things I got involved with, strangely enough, was assisting in liaison work inside the building with the Saudis uh, to get furniture and so forth. That was not my official mm -hmm. position, but I would occasionally work with Con Colonel Samir Turkey who um, asked me to, because he got along with me. And they care a great deal about how you treat them. Um, we're more down to business, and they're not. They want to like you, and then they'll do business. So anyway, we had gotten this huge table, conference table. I don't know how much it weighed, but geez, I think uh, five, six hundred pounds, whatever. Well, I came in, and I sat against the wall next to Charlie Bramlett, the, the deputy chief of protocol. And, um, and I'm waiting my turn to brief him on Secretary of the Navy's visit. This is before the war. And I'll never forget it as long as I live. I, um, I looked at General, what's his name? Oh, he's escaping me now. But anyway, one of the generals, the, an Air Force general from J3, General Moore. Um, general Moore was standing there, and he, uh, or sitting there, and General Schwarzkopf looked around the table. He said, all right, we've got to get to other business. Is there anybody else have any concerns, any whatever? And of course, the general's at the head of the table. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting against the wall, and Charlie's next to me, and a few other people who will be also briefing. I'm the first briefer. And um, General Moore said, well, General Yosak, who's commander of all army, mm -hmm. you got General Horner, who's in charge of all Air Force, yeah. and so on and so forth. So they're all four stars. You talk about the elephants. It's like so. Anyway, um, but this is all central command in the room. This is not commander of the Air Force, commander of the none yeah. of that. So General Moore, who happens to be Air Force, is saying that he has heard that General Yosak is not happy because this is going to be um, only Air. How do I say this? Let me say it this way: only Air Force will get involved. He's afraid it's going to be an air assault only, and that right. the Army will not be involved. Right. And they didn't come all the way over here not to help win a war. So, and he said it in other words that were a little more clipped and, and funny, which General Schwarzkopf didn't think was funny at all. No, he wasn't mad at General Moore. He was not happy about the news that General Yosak, 
in charge of the Army, was not happy and thinking it was all going to be an air situation. So General, everybody looked, <laughs> you had to be there, you knew he was not going to be happy. Mm -hmm. But General Schwarzkopf, you asked me what he was like, he can be a teddy bear, but he can also be a grizzly bear. Mm -hmm. And you look at the end of the table, and the color, you swear, is going from his toes, <laughs> rising up and going purple in his face. And he's like I said, he's got a big, he's a big man with a big face, and everything's purple. And he takes his fist, and he, and it just goes up in the air. And I swear, every eye was <laughs> on that fist, and it came down and hit the table. And this 800-pound table leapt off the floor. And everybody went, <laughs> and, and so we all, we all went back in our chairs, and, and I'm sitting there like this, and I'm against the wall. <laughs> and, and even General Moore, who's kind of relaxed yeah. for a uh, general, um, was, he was, and he said, and he did, he said, God damn it, doesn't anybody want to play a team sport here? Doesn't anybody, doesn't anyone get it? And he's yeah. screaming. And so anyway, that finished up at that moment. General Moore said, I will pass those words on, sir. And he said, I'll do it. And that was it. Yeah. And then he said, everybody out of here. OK, who's my next briefer? And he's <laughs> fit to be tied. Oh. And I looked at Charlie, and I go, Charlie, <laughs> I don't want to go to this one alone. Can you help me? He goes, you're on your own. Oh. I am leaving the room. And so I went up, and I was like, you know, because he was mad. And then as soon as I got up there, his face relaxed. And he said, so Karen, what are you going to tell me about this morning? And I was, so that was it. But uh, and it went fine. And um, anyway, it was. Uh, it, uh, he never got mad at me, but I will tell you something. You make one mistake one time with General Schwarzkopf, he forgives you. You make that same mistake mm -hmm. again, you are so gone, it isn't funny. Mm -hmm. And I would not have envied his immediate staff. Um, he had an aide and who's still at CENTCOM. I just called recently, and he's, he's a colonel now. But anyway, uh, but he also was a very gentle man. And um, I, I you know, I had moments that I couldn't believe. I remember in the war room, because when the war began, I would go around to these different offices collecting the data for this war book. And one of the parts of the data that I didn't mention is uh, EPWs, or Enemy Prison Prisoners of War. And, um, and I'd learned Arabic by then. Not a lot, oh. but I was very, well, I, I like languages, so I tend to listen. And, yeah. and so I asked one of the translators or interpreters if he would teach me some words. So each day he'd teach me more, and all the Saudi guards would teach me. And, so we could actually communicate, because they spoke no English at all. Yeah. So um, anyway, uh, I remember at one point walking through on what I call catwalk, where General Schwarzkopf left. We were two floors above ground originally. But as soon as the war began, General Schwarzkopf and company went three subfloors below ground. And, uh, and we, the protocol staff, stayed up on the second floor. <laughs> so I guess we were dispensable. <laughs> But anyway, he went below. So when I would do the war book, I'd go around to the staffs, and then I'd go down to the war room area along with other areas. Lots of you know, communication equipment and everything else. But it was a huge underground operation. It was amazing. And um, the one thing somebody who built it neglected to do was think about chemical, biological, and uh, not nuclear, but chemical and biological. But yeah, nuclear. All the vents to the basement were sucking the regular air. There was no filtration system. It just didn't, but anyway. So it was way, way down. And also, the floors were very deep. In other words, you might take 35 to 40 steps to go from one floor to the next. And so it was, very, it was really, really deep in the earth. And um, anyway, uh, so I remember one day that General Colin Powell was there and Secretary Dick Cheney, Secretary of State, excuse me, Secretary of Defense, Dick Cheney was there. General Schwarzkopf has his own immediate, oh, I guess it's OK to say Delta Force personal guard that's mm -hmm. not, you, nobody's supposed to know the Delta Force right. then. Right. Oh, geez, I wish I hadn't said it. But anyway, yeah. it's done. Um, and he has his own personal guard and also has a Saudi guard. So he's always surrounded by about 12 people, right. Saudi and American. And then um, what ended up happening is uh, when Schwarzkopf came down with Powell and Secretary Cheney, um, I, w I, happen to, oh, I happen to be walking uh, down the hall, and this man stopped me, and I said, "Assalamu alaikum," and uh, he was Saudi, and uh, "Wa alaikum salam," and, and I'm not Muslim, but it's okay to say that, yeah. and it's Allah be with you, and yeah. uh, and he would say, yeah. and also with you, yeah. kind of like Catholic Church, actually, <laughs> sort of different, but kind of similar. And then I'd say, uh, you know, "Kefal hal," how are you? 
And so anyway, this man came up to me, and I, I'm looking down the hall, and I could see these three men walking towards me at a very great distance, and I was kind of, you could always tell Schwarzkopf, because he just was yeah. presence larger than life. And this man stopped me, and he said, a different man than I was talking to, because there were Saudis all through there, too. And uh, he said, um, he said, do you, uh, I need you. He said, you're American? And I said, yes. And he said, uh, I need you up at uh, the, the front lines. I said, excuse me? And he said, I need you up at the front lines. He said, we have a, we EB, EPW camps. He said, and you speak perfect Arabic. And I looked at him, and I said, my accent may be good, but I only know about 40 words. He said, no, 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 I know you will work. And I, I just was in shock. And, I, and uh, I said, I don't know. You'll have to talk to my boss. And he said, who's that? And I said, him. And, uh, and this Schwarzkopf walk, which is a joke, because we all worked for him. But so he uh, walking down. And I had this view. It would have been a great picture um, of General Schwarzkopf, I think, I think he was in the middle, and then mm -hmm. Cheney and Powell on either side, uh -huh. surrounded by all of this security. Mm -hmm. And it was just this amazing photo. Uh, just was kind of amazing. But that was right next to the war room. And the point of the war book, by the way, was to give to General Schwarzkopf and the other people in the war room. And one of the things that was kind of wild for me is during the war, I um, went to, uh, I had to take General Schwarzkopf, I gave it to him twice a day. So I would take the old one and give him the new one, but I would transcribe what he had in the old one and put it into the new one so mm -hmm. he could still read the same notes. Mm -hmm. And I am doing this in the war room. So I'd go in front of General Schwarzkopf and I gave him his, mm -hmm. and then I'd go to General so-and-so or whoever it might be. And finally, um, I remember one time I was in there and there was a commander of uh, Saudi forces. And he's standing there, and Schwarzkopf is standing there, and his face is purple, and he's yelling at him. He said, you don't understand. And so normally, I would whip in, do my thing, and whip out. And I just took my time, and I wanted to hear what was going on. <laughs> so I was doing the transcribing very slowly, and I'm flipping. I have to go through the entire book page by page. Mm -hmm. So I could hear Schwarzkopf saying, you don't understand. Your people are in, our, in harm's way now. We, I've given the signal. I've tried to get you to move. You're not moving. Um, you've got to get them out of there now. He says, oh, I will, I, will, I will do this, I will do this. He said, but your communications are different than ours. The craft, aircraft are attacking now. Your people are dying now. And I'm just standing there, and I'm, I'm in shock. And so the, commission, the um, commander of the Saudi forces got on the, the field phone and started screaming to get his people out of there. And I don't know whatever happened. I'm sure we had oh. friendly fire situations. but. Uh, but I never did find out, and uh, so yeah, that that was the war book. Uh, but and I also worked with the briefings, you know, the nightly briefings. I collected all the data. Um, not part of my job. Just well, I guess it was. Um, whenever we gave scud attacks and air attacks and uh, bridges hit and uh, scuds that went up and Patriots that had been fired, how many we did? That was something that I did. And then I remember picking out from combat camera. Most people remember the luckiest man in Iraq, uh, where he's going over a bridge in Iraq, and one of our um, aircraft fires on the bridge while he's on it. And the guy is driving rather quickly. And they tried to plan it so they wouldn't hit him, because we always try right. to hit as few people as possible. And um, anyway, it hit, the, it hit the bridge, and it exploded. And you're sort of waiting with bated breath. And then the car keeps on driving, and everybody's, yay, yay. <laughs> well, anyway, I was asked to pick out some films, and I saw some films that I decided against doing. Because, unfortunately, there was another picture just like it. It was The Unluckiest Man, wow. in, man in Iraq. So, you know, um, it was an amazing, amazing time, I guess. Saudi Arabia was. So how long were you there? Only six months. Six months? <laughs> yes. So when did you leave? I left in uh, the end of February. Um, I left just before the ground war. I think I actually left before the ground war started. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was based on my father. I was very worried. Oh. And I'd been begging them to let me go back. And, uh, and they did eventually let me go back. So, um, but plus, I'd been there over six months. You're only supposed to go for 180 days. So they let me uh, mm -hmm. under a lot of duress. Mm -hmm. there, was a, there were fights over, this doesn't sound good, but there were fights over me. I had gone, um, not me personally, but what I did. Mm -hmm. I had gone out to handle Seknav's visit in Bahrain. And um, when I, I went on board USS 
Blue Ridge, which was in Bahrain, was tied up, and it was Navy Central Command headquarters in the Mideast. Uh, and what happened was, um, I forgot what I was saying. Um, well, I wanted to take you home anyway. What, what happened after you went home oh, and right. checked up on okay. your father? Uh, he was, you know, his heart was not mm -hmm. good. And, uh, but anyway, I got on a medevac flight mm -hmm. and flew home, or I flew actually to New Jersey, which flew me to Florida where my mm -hmm. parents were at that time. And I came home and um, stood there in, in an airport and thinking, um, where is everybody? <laughs> Because uh, I came, I went alone. I came home alone. Yeah. So it was uh, there was no you know no fanfare, no no anything, and um, and my parents saw me, and that was a good moment. And then I spent a couple weeks in Saudi Arabia, in uh, Florida. A friend came down to visit, and uh, it was sort of you know spinning down from an amazing event. And uh, anyway, so I finished there, and uh, then went back to my original command, New Newport, Rhode Island, right. and did. Um, company officer again and all the rest. I did have a quick uh, time in the USS Constitution in Boston mm -hmm. uh, as, a fi as a sort of a thank you, um, and that worked out rather well. I think Captain Doubleday arranged that for me. He was a public affairs guy. Mm -hmm. And then I went back, finished out my tour, and asked for Naval War College staff position. We had a little fight back and forth, and uh, it didn't go. And so I went, I said, then I want to go to Washington if you're not, I, I threatened to get out of the Navy. It was mm -hmm. one of those. I said, if you want me to stay, give me the one thing I've ever asked for. I never asked for anything. I did whatever they asked me to do. Mm -hmm. And I'm supposed to have what they call a silver bullet. And they didn't give it to me. So I said, you know what, I'm done. And the captain of the base called me up. He said, you can't do this. Why are you doing this? I said, because you wouldn't let me go to the other side of the base. Mm -hmm. He said, what can I do to keep you? And I said, get me a job in Washington. Half hour later, I had a job in Washington. Oh, wonderful. So I went to the Pentagon and did um, rope policy, foreign policy, for uh, Nicaragua, Honduras, Belize, Cuba, Haiti, Eastern Caribbean, and worked with the State Department and CIA, DIA, Congress. Mm -hmm. And the policy that I wrote would be for security assistance, things like if, you've, if you go to a country in Latin America that has a paramilitary force, mm -hmm. we try and teach them what it is to be a straight police force mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, what, what a lot of Latin American countries mm -hmm. have gotten a bad reputation for. And we also helped out in, um, I wrote security assistance with regard to hurricanes in Eastern Caribbean. We dealt with drugs, which was a hopeless, endless, never going to be solved thing, um, but we would give money towards their security assistance in the country to try and fight the war on drugs. Mm -hmm. And um, it did seem rather, it, it, it seemed hopeless to me then and it still seems hopeless now. But anyway, so that was uh, supposedly an internship I was supposed to learn. Instead, uh, we had the administration switch. It went from Bush to Clinton. Mm -hmm. We lost six political appointees. and. Um, and I was just doing basic stuff, and all of a sudden I went from being a, a pupil to being in charge of six countries, uh. and which the general public shouldn't know, but anybody yeah. who sees this will. But I learned <laughs> fast, and I did it right. And, um, and then I finished up there and went to uh, the only tour I did for career reasons, and that was I wanted to make a lieutenant commander, yeah. and I had to get a department head tour, and that was... Um, Naval Reactor Headquarters in Washington, mm -hmm. and that was not my favorite tour. It's Dickensian England in the Navy. Uh. We won't go into it. But I was a Assistant Director of uh, Administration and Personnel. Um, the operational side was to, did you ever hear of Admiral Hyman and Rick Over? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. This is who I worked for, his uh, second successor. Uh, Admiral Bruce DeMars, who was great, mm -hmm. but I had, um, it was just a different environment. It was all engineers, very high stress, it was a different world completely. It wasn't military, it wasn't civilian, it was in its own category. And it was a, a very oppressive, suppressive, mm -hmm. negative environment, um, which I have to say I hated, mm -hmm. to be frank with you. However, what I did enjoy uh, was we were the ones, I was the one who set up the interviews for all the incoming uh, nukes. 
nuclear engineers. Right. And that was fun because they come from ROTC, they come from the yeah. academy, and you were their first foray into the nuclear world. So whatever you did, and you were, I was also the one who told them that they didn't make the program. So oh. I'd sit there and I'd say, you know, we thank you very much for coming. They've been through interview after interview. They've had to do uh, computations, calculus computations, and medical, med uh, you know, all kinds of engineering things, and knowing whose theory that was and whose theorem that was. And they've really gone through hell. And then at the end of which, um, they'd send me in to give them the good or bad news. And, um, and it was very hard. It's like firing 20 people in a row. Mm -hmm. So, because they've been waiting their whole th three or four years at the academy to, to get this opportunity. But overall, was very, that aspect was the most fun. The rest of it was not fun at all. Now, geographically, where were you? That was in Washington also. Washington also. Yeah. And how long did that? That was a position? year. It was year. supposed to be two to three years, but mm -hmm. I decided uh, my dad was not well. Right. And I thought, I've been in the Navy 10 years. I made lieutenant commander, right. even to my own boss's chagrin. Yeah. Uh, and not my, Brewster Mars I, I got along with, but my own immediate boss was, was not my best friend, nor was I hers. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, I had made it, and, mm -hmm. um, and I thought, you've made the grade, you made lieutenant commander, you've been in for 10 years, if you stay another year, you might as well stay for 20. And my dad was failing, he had Parkinson's disease and the heart issue, mm -hmm. and, um, and I thought, maybe it's time to go home, because this was a horrible tour, horrible, horrible, horrible. And it was a rotten way to go out. Plus, we wore civilian clothing. I didn't even oh. wear my uniform. So it was kind of not the greatest way to go out. I mean, it was totally voluntary, but uh, they fought me. They didn't want me to leave. Uh, that was another story. But anyway, uh, so I left, and I went home. And, uh, and I, my father got sick and ultimately, over time, um, died. And then, unfortunately, in between many other things going wrong, uh, my mother also got sick, mm. and then I took care of her uh, up until a certain point, and then she went through uh, chemo, or excuse me, radiation therapy and so forth. This is a bad time, so it was, uh, I didn't want to leave the Navy in the first place. My mother warned me, she said, don't leave for us. And I said, oh, I'm not, I'm not, mm. and I lied. Yeah. And, but it wasn't totally them. It really was that last tour had done me in. When you have, when you somebody has control of your life that much and can, so determined, you know, and my mother said when I went in, you know you're going to be stuck for four years. Well, I stayed 10 and I loved it. Right. So it's, I wish that first, I guess it's lucky that first tour didn't happen in the beginning because I might not have done 10 years. Um, so, but overall, uh, if I could wipe that one away, I would. I'm sure everybody's got a tour they'd like to get rid of, but, <laughs> but it was the, uh, the Navy was without hesitation the best experience of my life. And, uh, what have you been doing professionally since then? Well, when I first got out, I, to be honest with you, I took care of my father. Right. When he'd gone to the hospital and then mm -hmm. they sent him home and basically said, there's nothing more we can do and you should send him somewhere else. I said, no, let's take him home. So we did and uh, so I didn't work for that period of time and then I did go to work um, after that in a contract position with a public relations firm and then, and that was for, I guess, almost half a year and then I did, um, uh, worked with the Bank of Boston and Bay Bank when they were merging and I did, I'd done a lot of training in the Navy so I just thought okay let's try training and I did uh, training for the merger for their systems integration mm -hmm. and that was interesting mm -hmm. but uh, meanwhile I was not in the reserves I had not affiliated with a unit mm -hmm. and it was because one I had such a sour feeling from my last tour which ticked me off because I had such a great time in the whole mm -hmm. Navy uh, scheme of things and then I, uh, my mother kept saying, please affiliate, please affiliate with a unit, a reserve unit. Mm -hmm. And I said, I will, I will, I will. And then, unfortunately, my mother died. And, um, and it was right after she died that I affiliated, sort of for her. Mm -hmm. Both my parents wanted me to get back with the reserves. Right. I think they won't, both wanted me to go back in. And I've had my wonder, you know, I wondered if I should. Mm -hmm. But, because um, it was the best, even though I had a bad last tour. So I affiliated with a reserve unit. And then I also, at that time, took... I actually, it was when my mother, we didn't know my mother was that ill, I went to work for Fidelity uh, at the World Trade Center and Seaport Hotel and in an, a training manager slash director position for the opening of the Seaport Hotel. And that was, I was there for two years, a little over two years. And um, I, I think I was burnt out. I was doing 80 and 100 hour weeks. Oh. And it was all the time my mother was dying and I would leave work and go and take care. She was in the hospital by that point and I'd leave at 10 o'clock at night, seven days a week, 
go to the hospital, be there till 1 in the morning, drive home, get up at 5.30, 6 o'clock, drive into Boston, stay till 10, go see my mother. And it just kept going. And at the end of it, I'd beg them for help. I'd beg them for an assistant. I'd beg them for a lot of things. And nothing ever came through. And uh, I stayed till the opening, said I've, I've had it. You know, I, I didn't get what I wanted. And then they begged me to stay again. And I stayed. And then I realized I'd been called several times by the Department of Veterans Services. And they said, Commissioner Hudner at the time, and said, we need someone like you in public relations. He said, we, we really, really want you, and would you consider it? And he had called me a year or two before, and I said, I, I'll consider it, but I just don't know. I'm here now, and I want to get, you know, go through this and open the hotel. Mm -hmm. So we ended up, uh, finally, I took the job uh, and said goodbye to Fidelity and the World Trade Center and, and took the job at Department of Veteran Services as the Director for External Affairs. And that's what you're doing now. Yes. And I'm in charge of our oral history program. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. But anyway, so yes, and I and I do I work with the media and I work with mm -hmm. veterans, which is my favorite part, you know, and I try and get medals for people that never got them, yeah. especially World War II, because very few people actually physically got their medals. It was mostly um, the ribbon they were given, maybe, but they never actually saw the medals. And it's only recently when their grandchildren start asking them, What did you do in the war? Because they find out somehow through Private Ryan, the movie Private Ryan, Saving Private Ryan, or Tom Brokaw's book, and all the attention that's been paid. So all of a sudden, everybody's realizing, I got to do this. I'm not getting any younger, and my kids want it, and my grandchildren want it, and um, and so do I, actually. So um, so I try and help them that way. And uh, we are just now getting involved in your oral history program, trying to help it to go on a statewide level. And um, so there are a lot of things. I do a lot of things, and it's a lot of work. Uh, we're also doing a lot with the World War I veterans, though there are not many left. We've got about 16 or 17, and uh, trying to uh, recognize them among getting uh, oral histories. And that's the short version of that. So that's what I'm doing now. Is there any uh, thought or memory you'd like to share with those who are viewing this tape, something that perhaps you would have liked that I asked you? And um, Anything you'd like to share with future generations? Well, yes, and you could probably predict what I'm about to say. Um, it doesn't matter what your politics are. Um, I think everybody should serve. Uh, if they don't serve, I think ideally 75% should serve two years in the military and see how they like it. I think it should be mandatory, um, like other countries do, um, mainly because people don't know what they're missing. I had the most incredible experience. I wouldn't trade for the world. And I was given responsibility. It, it was motivational. I was proud. I felt like I mattered when I was in Saudi Arabia. Even though I was this little peon, I felt like what I did mattered. And it's a very rare person, a very rare situation, that you can do a job that makes a difference. You can when you're in social work, but um, that's, the other, that's the other end of it. You can do that's. To make difference in somebody's lives and to defend your country, or at least be there in case you need to defend the country, um, I'm extremely proud of it. And I don't have the exact quote, but uh, John F. Kennedy once said, uh, if, if asked, uh, and this is wrong, if asked, uh, what would I say I was proudest of? Uh, I would say that I joined the United States Navy without hesitation, with the exception of taking care of my parents. That would be my number yeah. one but my number two would be my whole Navy experience. It is the best, most exciting, most adventurous, um, most maturing. Um, this, I, can't, I, I could be a recruiter today. <laughs> Even though I had a horrible tour yeah. on one of them, I just can't say enough about it. And I think kids are missing out so much today on the excitement of being in the service. And I'm not a recruiter, so I don't have to say this. But I gain so much. I have pride. I develop self-confidence and self-esteem that, um, since I've left, has not been the same. I mean, it just—it just was. They give you the opportunity to arise to occasions, mm -hmm. and you do. So that's what I would say. Thank you very much for a wonderful interview. You're welcome. Thank you.